This is from a woman who is learning how to apply real love in the workplace where she is a supervisor. She said, I don't think I'll ever get over how much fun it is to see the crew, the people that she works with and supervises, light up whenever I'm around. I mean, wow, what a thing to hear. I hope I never do. Meaning I hope I never get over this, how fun this is. You have a really fun soul, which before you felt loved unconditionally, you couldn't possibly have known because you were afraid all the time. Fear blots out everything else. And you have a capacity for loving people. Another surprise to you. But without fear, there are all kinds of surprises. You're just noticing and developing your gifts. And other people are feeling it. You're benefiting because it's fun, because life is happier. And they're benefiting from your loving them. Kind of a no-lose deal, huh? You continue, their expression seems like it's getting more special, or maybe I just keep opening up more, or maybe it's both. Yeah, I'd go with both. You say, sometimes they call out across the parking lot to me. Um, I can tell you that in, in all the years that I worked for people, I don't remember ever calling across the parking lot to catch the, the attention of my supervisor. Um, I might have ducked down behind a car so I didn't have to have a conversation with the, him or her, but n call out, nah. She continues, they call across the parking lot to me with endearing names for me. It feels warm and special. Yeah, I would think so. <laughs> Especially since you know what it's like to work for a supervisor where mm, this kind of relationship did not happen. You conclude, I've been grinning about that all night and I just had to share it with you. It's the same seconds later in the lobby where we work, where the guys are like, you know, watching football. And then again at the elevator and again down the hall. This feeling just is everywhere. I wonder what it's like for them to be around a woman who isn't afraid of them or trying to manipulate them or trying to attract them. Uh, yeah, no kidding. This isn't just about woman, man. It's unusual to be around anybody who's not manipulating us or protecting themselves or playing a game of some sort. But when you introduce different genders, oh my, does it get much more complicated. And you conclude by saying, I'm, I'm happy for them. That's just sweet, and I'm happy for you. And thanks for telling me and everybody else this. People like to be loved. Memorize this, really. Put it in granite in your workplace. And you're loving them, which is why all this is working. It's just not complicated. New subject. I know a woman who's been practicing real love for several months. And she hangs on to her pain, pain about her marriage, the way she raises her children, her past, everything. She just clings to it. She writes, it's the shame, isn't it? That stops me from growing. The feeling that I should have my life figured out by now, combined with, I suppose, the fear that it will never end, that Faith in people won't help me, that faith in God won't help me, so I'm ashamed of my confusion and my pain. Yes. You watch this over and over again. If you persist in a negative feeling that you have about yourself, pain, guilt, obligation, duty, um, making mistakes, whatever, there's shame involved because shame means that you're ashamed about being you. Whereas guilt is just a momentary negative feeling about something you've done. You're not only in real pain because of all the things that you're going through right now, but you feel ashamed of being in pain. 
So you're having a really very natural human reaction to pain, and then you're ashamed that you're having it. So in the process, you multiply your pain. You take the real pain, you make it much bigger, which then, of course, becomes real. And with the shame, the pain also feels hopeless because there's no way out when you're ashamed of who you are, which multiplies the pain even further. I mean, yuck. You conclude by asking, why am I ashamed of being in pain? How does that link to my past? This is easy because I know you and I know your mother. Your mother hurt you over and over and over again. And then she blamed you for her pain and for hurting her. I remember the phrases. She would get up in the morning and she would scream at you that her life was ruined and that she was in pain because she had to take care of you stupid children. So she openly declared her pain and she openly declared that it was your fault to a kid who was seven. Well, that's just insanity. But it wasn't insanity to you. It seemed true because that's how you were raised, that mom just told you how the world was. And it didn't seem insane to her because that's how she was raised. It is possibly the greatest tragedy in the world that we, on the whole, 99% of us walk around simply reacting. Our pain reacting to the pain of other people. It's almost like we're not even there. It's, it's like setting billion, billiard balls in endless motion on a table and they just bang around the table and knock each other about. That's what we do as people. So she hurt you and then she made you feel ashamed for hurting her because she blamed you, which wasn't true in the first place. So you've carried around all of that pain, magnified by your shame, um, magnified by the feeling of hopelessness. And in the end, you just feel horrible. But you're beginning to discover a way out. And there is a way out. There's a way completely out. We don't just learn to survive. We learn to actually thrive, live. New subject. Here's somebody who said, I had the grandkids over. I took them to play in the park 10 minutes from my house. Uh, me and Noah, my grandson, were playing a game of tag. I ran at him, but I banged into one of those big wooden supports that hold up the slide very hard. Uh, and then in parenthesis, she writes, I know, and at my age too. I completely understand. <laughs> having done similar things myself. And for a grandma baby, you got some speed in you. Way to go. Uh, you got some life chasing your grandson around a playground. Oh, what a what a fun sight. Um, I can tell you that I wasn't chased anywhere by any of my grandparents. Um, such a thought would have been actually inconceivable. So mm, bless your heart. You continue. It floored me, literally. <laughs> Uh, catching one side of my back. I also hit my nose on the ground. I got up and I could hardly breathe. I think I cracked my ribs or bruised them badly as I can't bend or cough or laugh or anything without it hurting a lot. And it's impeding my natural movement like big time. It's really slowed me down. Well, having worked in emergency rooms for six years, yeah, it really sounds like you. Cracked a rib, for sure. That Those are the symptoms. You say, it took me ages to get into bed and get lying down. Impossible to get into any position that wasn't painful. Much like a lot of things in life, we take our ribs for granted until we break one. You continue, as I lay there, I went into stories about how 
I wouldn't be able to pack the remaining boxes before Tuesday when they were going to be picked up because we're moving. I wouldn't be able to clean the place and leave it how I want to. I went into this scenario in my head of Thursday when I'm flying out and how I wouldn't be able to lift my suitcase up on the security belt to get checked at the airport. I wouldn't be able to climb the steps to the plane. I wouldn't be able to blah, 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 blah. It went on and on. All the things I couldn't do. I would be just a little puddle of a cripple. Worse still, I was suffering emotionally. I felt truly immobile, paralyzed by my pain in more ways than one. I cried, but that hurt too. <laughs> yeah, with a cracked rib, everything hurts. I couldn't laugh, cry, blow my nose, cough. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty screwed. I've treated a lot of broken ribs. I've had one once, really does hurt. Everything hurts except blinking your eyes, and then only if you do it really slowly. Seems like all of you is connected to those darned ribs. Are you feeling the force of all these stories yet? All this fear, all this, what, exaggeration, all this catastrophizing has, well, you have already noticed it because you said you feel immobilized. We feel paralyzed with enough fear and shame and helplessness. Now, not only are we in pain, but we can't move. Like having a permanent itch from head to toe and you're in a complete body cast. Wow, that's pretty screwed. You continue. Um, I even went into what if my ribs are crap cra or cracked and they puncture my lungs and I won't be able to breathe at all and I'll die and the kids won't know what to do. <laughs> You're good at this. And, but then I saw what was happening. None of the things I was afraid of were happening. Not then. I wasn't at the airport where I couldn't do all those things. I was still breathing, hurt, but I was still breathing. All stories, I remembered that I was loved. Oh, beautiful. If we'd all remember that, mm, you still have pain, but it's not disabling anymore. It's not paralyzing. I remembered that I'm loved. I have what matters. I saw it. I stopped it. It felt different. I was still sore, but now everybody listen to what she says next. I was still sore, but the suffering wasn't there. Ooh, that's really nicely said. Pain is inevitable, but suffering is an option. And she's living this as she's talking about it. And then being no longer paralyzed by pain, solutions came into my head. Up to that point, when I was in fear, I couldn't see any solutions. No, I would just be lying there in the middle of the road uh, uh, in front of the airport, being run over by every car that came by <laughs> because I couldn't move. <laughs> Cracking, I suppose, the rest of my, my ribs. Solutions came into my head. The boxes will get packed. They'll have to be weighed one item at a time. I could fill them that way. Uh, so they could be properly shipped at the airport. I can always ask somebody to lift my suitcase for me. I had to stifle a giggle, but I had to stifle one because it was too sore to giggle. <laughs> Nothing was a problem anymore. And then she writes, sigh, sigh of relief. She also adds, it's a shallow sigh because otherwise my rib hurts. <laughs> but she concludes with hallelujah. So she went from paralyzed with fear, helpless, hopeless, miserable, to hallelujah. Just by doing what? By changing her judgment, event, judgment, feeling, reaction. We've talked about this many times. Events happen. You're going to hit your head. Uh, in her case, she hit her head and fell down and cracked a rib and smashed her face. It's going to rain. You're going to get a flat tire. Stuff 
happens. And then we think what happens is we a, a terrible event happens and we go straight to anger. So it's just event reaction. No. The way you live your life will be determined by what you do between the event and how you react. It will be de determined by the judgments you make and the feelings that follow. No kidding. Your life will not be determined by events. I've seen two people who've, who've experienced nearly identical events so many hundred times I couldn't count them. Both been in a hurricane, both been in a tornado, both been physically assaulted, both been in a war, both whatever. And one is happy and one is not. Why? Because in between event and reaction, we make a judgment. And then the feeling follows. This woman fell, cracked her ribs right at the time when she was packing boxes to move and was going about to get on an airplane. And she was catastrophizing. And then she stopped and said, whoa, none of these terrible things are happening. I'm going to be okay. I could get somebody to help me, for example. There's a novel thought. So by changing her judgment, the event stayed the same. She still had a broken rib. She didn't feel hopeless. And she didn't have to react by being paralyzed and more miserable. Oh, this is beautiful. We all do this about things. Um, we Something happens and we tell ourselves catastrophic stories till we're just incapacitated. You remembered that you were loved. You said it. I remembered that I was loved and the emotional pain stopped. Well, all pain is additive. Emotional pain adds to physical pain, which adds to emotional pain and you spiral straight into the toilet. You stopped the spiral. You did that. That's huge. And then you could make choices. So can we all. I mean, this is just a beautiful story. I wouldn't care if we just quit at this point. New subject. This is from a man in real love. He says, Connie and I have been dating for over two years and we've been discussing getting married. And yeah, you've done a lot of preparation for this personally and together. So nice work. We decided to speak individually to her three children who are ages 15, 19, and 24. The last one is married. Along with my two daughters who are older, a little bit older than hers, about our marriage plans. Connie's oldest daughter, 24, is, to say the least, a very angry girl. When Connie shared our plans with her for us to get married, the girl said, you need to stop dating that man. And if you marry him, I will never see you again. And neither will my future children, my future children. And on top of that, you will eventually die alone. <laughs> well, don't sugarcoat it, baby. <laughs> Her attitude, you continue, has also bled over to the 15-year-old son who lives with Connie and periodically sees his biological father, who is a real controlling nutcase. Uh, he thinks women are property meant to fulfill all the needs of the husband. Um, and unfortunately, his disdain and disrespect for women has influenced the 15-year-old's outlook on relationships, especially with women. Not a surprise. So the controlling father, this is me now, has controlled the attitude of all the kids. He has made them believe that mom, now listen to this. Here, here's why all this is happening. Mom has no right to be happy. I mean, why else would the 15-year-old react badly? Because she's just a piece of property. She doesn't have a right to be happy. And in a world of limited imitation love, if she's happy, well, then one of them has to lose. Do you see? It, it's, it's a zero-sum game. There's only so much, and so you compete for it. If anybody's got more than you do, well, then you got to do something. I mean, let's kill them. 
The 24-year-old believes that mom has no right to be happy. This man has never said anything negative to the 24-year-old daughter. The 24-year-old daughter just doesn't believe mom should be happy. And so, well, you're going to die alone and you're going to never see your grandchildren and I'm going to do everything I can to punish you. Insanity. But not to her because this is how she was raised by her father. I couldn't count how many times people have said to me, oh, come on. You're telling me that the reaction of a 24-year-old woman in this moment is due to the way that she was treated when she was four by her father and the way she saw her father treat her mother when she was four. Yes. Yes, that's, thank you. That was a very nice summary. That's exactly what I'm saying. Back to the writer. I'm not sure what to say or how to respond to kids when they make these kinds of comments. I would think you would be just a little befuddled uh, since the comments are so insane. Now, I'm not going to tell you what to say. I'm going to give you an example of what you could say, just so that you know that you're not nuts thinking that this is crazy. And so that you know that there is a perfectly sensible answer. You could modify this answer. You can come up with your own. Don't care. What I'm trying to give you is the confidence that there is one. That's it. It's what I tell almost everybody when I say, go say this. Mm -hmm. And they come back and they say, well, I didn't say what you said. I modified it this way. What do I care? So you say to the kids, you get to choose how you feel and what you do. See, no accusation, um, no lecture. You're telling them that they get to do whatever they want to as far as feeling and doing. So far, we're good, huh? You're not defending. Then you continue. We get to choose we, meaning your mother and I, get to choose how we feel and what we do. Now, notice the logical progression here. You're telling them they get to choose what they feel and do, and they're going to agree with that. Like, well, duh. Well, now they're trapped. Is this intentional on my part? Yeah, kind of. Um, because then the next sentence is, well, if you get to choose how you feel and what you do, well, then we also get to choose how we feel and what we do. We're choosing to be happy. And we hope that you do too. Do you see how simple this is? You don't get into defending. You don't get into, well, we're not doing anything to you. No, you just stick with what's true. They get their choice, you get your choice. Now, back to you. Your daughter, her daughter, who's 24, can express this all she wants. I hate you. I'm going to keep you away from the children. Blah, 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 blah. If she wants to create a little cesspool where she lives, just go for it. But the 16-year-old, I can't remember now whether he's 15 or 16, but the 16-year-old who's living at home does not get to express it all he wants. He's living at home and being supported by her. You two get to choose to have a happy home. And the 16-year-old boy does not get to spoil that any more than he gets to choose to say, smoke in the house. Or periodically, as you're doing things, just you know, blow an air horn. Really, it's that rude. That, that kind of anger and disapproval is poison. And he has no right to a vocal opinion that poisons the home. Now, what do you do if he does? Because he might continue to do it. Then he gets the natural consequence of poisoning the home. If you have somebody visit who is poisoning the home or smoking or whatever, would you allow them to stay? No. Well, then you tell the 16-year-old, um, you have till tomorrow at noon to move in with your father. You don't add your father, who is the one who poisoned your mind in the first place, and who would just love to commiserate with you about what a horrible, terrible person your mother is. No, you just say you have till tomorrow to move in with your father. There. See, Clearly, he prefers the love of his mother, or he'd be living with his dad, who he hates. But now he thinks that he gets to control his mother's love. 
he feels threatened by you coming into the picture. Really? So he's, he thinks he can control that. Uh, yeah, well, he can't. You continue. Fortunately, the 19-year-old, because remember there were three, who's off to college, is completely happy with the idea that we're going to get married. Um, so what do we do with this overall mess? This is going to be really novel to you. So memorize it. You two do what you want. Really. The kids can grow up and they can get with the program that you're getting married or not. If the 24 year old decides to excommunicate you from her inner circle, she gets to. Uh, if the 16 year old decides to excommunicate you, he gets to. But he gets to do that while he's living with his dad, who it turns out is a completely selfish human being. This is obvious from what he's said and done. He believes that women are to be owned. Uh, He's not going to want his 16-year-old son around while he's controlling everything else in the world. It would be mm, inconvenient. So they can get with the program or not. If anything persuades them to accept your marriage, it will be the happiness of their mother. No kidding. Even though they were taught that she doesn't have a right to be happy, when they see that their mother just glows because she's around you, very few kids maintain an objection to that. I mean, what are you going to say when somebody's really happy? Uh, I hate it that you're happy. Not very many people would have the uh, emotional stupidity to say that out loud. If you put off your marriage, because I've heard you say that plan, well, we'll put off getting married for another two or three years till the 16-year-old is out of the house. You've got to be kidding me. If you put off your marriage because the 16-year-old objects, then what happens? You teach him only that victims rule the world, which is actually mostly true. But why do you need to perpetuate this lie? You, in addition, teach him control and entitlement. The 24-year-old, oh, whatever, She's a miserable person. You ignore her reaction. You're not going to change it. It might change over time as she sees that the two of you are happy, but you're not going to change it by talking to her. So my suggestion, uh, you were planning on getting married now. And the only thing that's changed is that now you have this reaction of the children to deal with. Uh, get married. Really? Like, I don't know, now? Um Get married at City Hall, uh, have a ceremony at your house, send out a last minute text to your kids that say, says you're invited, you can come or not. Do it whatever way you want to, but do it. Don't put it off and keep talking about it and worrying about it and trying to manage other people's feelings, which you don't really get to do anyway. New subject. This is from a mother who learned enough about real love to have a serious talk with her teenage daughter. And in the process of the talk, she sent me many of the sentences that she spoke. One of them was this, I don't think I've prepared you to be in this world. Ah, uh, that's like hall of fame parenting. No kidding. Our kids know algebra, geometry, sociology, um, government, history. Um, it it kind of goes on and on. Reading, language skills, blah, 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 blah. Most of which you will never use. In my final career, uh, as I was sitting there operating on people under a microscope, uh, I used my education prior to actually the time when I was trained, being trained to be a surgeon, I used my education prior to that, all of it, the trigonometry, the algebra, the history, the never, really, never. So we teach our kids these really limited skills, which they'll almost never use. And yet nobody ever sits down and teaches them the course called life with a capital L, just like you would see in a university uh, syllabus, uh, university, uh, there's a name for them, uh, 
description of courses. I um, uh, can't remember now what they call it. It's been too many years ago. Um, there's no course called that. Living. Life. That's a course you use every single day. It would include loving, forgiveness. It would include feelings of self-worth. It would include relationships. Nobody teaches that. You sat down with your daughter and said, I don't think I prepared you to be in this world. In other words, I didn't teach you the course called life, but we're going to start teaching it now. Ah, oh, our entire world would be different if parents taught this course. I've mentioned it before, but I'm going to mention it again. I, I read a magazine a week and I flip through a newspaper and read it in about 30 seconds a day because it all says the same stuff. But periodically I see a description of some tragedy. Uh, one was a great big magazine cover and all it said across the front of it was rape, uh, talking about rape in colleges. Or you see the big description of the shootings in pick a place, Kinderhook, um, Colorado, uh, Las Vegas, blah, 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 blah. And then what do we, what do we talk about? Well, we need more metal detectors. Uh, we need fewer guns. We need, and, and I'm not taking a gun position. Uh, that's more emails than I really want to deal with. Um, I've read these articles cover to cover. Those are the articles that I take the magazine for, is to read what experts believe about these problems. And they always come up with a way to treat the symptoms. So we have rape on campuses. Well, then uh, take a Tylenol. Really? That, that's their solution. Let's increase reporting and let's blah, blah, blah. A guy from the 32nd floor of the, I think, Mandalay Bay Hotel in Las Vegas shoots 600 people. Well, let's do something about guns. Or maybe we should make the windows of the Mandalay Bay bulletproof. Um, the reason I read these articles is because I have yet to read one, not one, where somebody said, you know, there might be something wrong with the, um, the way that we teach our children. Because the one common denominator in all of these tragedies, with the exception of hurricanes and tornadoes, uh, is people. They are all unhappy people. I've been doing this for years, so I could tell you this just for a fact because it's become a little hobby. Um, they come out with a tragedy. Somebody does some terrible thing. Um, they say, gosh, and he was just such a normal guy. Or the phrase is, let's see, they, they ask the neighbors, what was he like? You know, he was just kind of quiet and unremarkable. And then I wait for mm, two weeks or so. For the reporters to, you know, get off their bottoms on the couch and, you know, move around and actually ask some people. And then you discover, oh, well, this guy was ignored from childhood. He was a misfit uh, in high school. Um, he was raised in a divorced family. Uh, his mother worked all the time or his mother was a prostitute or crack addict or whatever. He had no idea where his father. He was a miserable human being every time not most of the time every time nobody ever talks about what are we going to do about that they just talk about how are we going to prevent shootings you're kidding me that'd be like talking about how are we going to raise crops in the desert but let's not talk about water let's not talk about rain or irrigation or snow melt or you're all joking, right? We've got to start talking about the water, which is love. Until kids feel loved, they're going to do this stuff. They're going to act out. I see little four-year-olds who just terrorize, I use the word intentionally, terrorize their families. I had a CEO call me one day and he was saying, our entire family is upset. 
it's out of control. There's nothing that we can do without some sort of meltdown. Um, the child screams and controls and demands, and we've just run out of options. And I say, how old is your child? To the CEO of a major corporation. He's four, four years old. And he controls the child. He controls the family. He controls the CEO of a major corporation. They should play that little film at the shareholders meeting. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> I have no need to punish anybody. We do not know how to raise our kids. So here's this kid terrorizing his family at four. You think he's not going to terrorize people when he gets older? What are the odds that he's going to become a bully in high school? What are the odds that he'll be one of those people who bring some guns to school and start shooting some people? Or who treats his wife like a piece of property, like the man that we talked about earlier? Or on and it doesn't matter what the reaction is. The end result is an emotionally dead human being who will then get married to another emotionally dead human being, and they'll raise emotionally dead children um, who are then going to act out in their own way. And now we have rape on college campuses. It's all caused by a lack of love. And yet we're talking about, well, let's just put a Band-Aid over it so we can't see it. That'll do it. And if it gets twice as big, well, then we'll get four Band-Aids. At some point, we really, really have to pay attention to the solution. No kidding. And to what the real problem is. Or we're going to keep having this. And we're going to keep having endless panel discussions. I never watch live television. But every once in a while after a tragedy, I'll turn it on for 30 seconds just to confirm what is always true. When the uh, reporter says with this look of practiced concern, so, doctor, can you tell us in the midst of this tragedy and pain and suffering and bleeding and aortas spurting, and because that's the job of you know reporters to get your attention, why is this happening? Why? Why? We keep hearing that question. And I'm in the back row of the audience going, uh, we know why. It's not a mystery. Not only do we know why, we know the solution. And we're not doing it because it would require that we admit that we are not great parents. It would require that we admit that we're not loving. And boy, we can't have that, can we? Yeah, we kind of need that. New subject. Here's somebody that says, if I needed another reminder of the importance of living with the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, as well as love. I just had a message from an old school friend. She's been married twice, had a child with another man, and then a year or two uh, ago appeared to have finally found her ideal match, her ideal partner. So she said, or at least so she said on her you know, Facebook page and in her messages to me. He's very good looking. He's wealthy. There are so many photos of them on Facebook looking like such a beautiful couple doing beautiful things that I actually stopped following her posts. It was too distracting because a bit of jealousy crept in. Facebook is all about comparing. It should be called the, the comparison site. Look how much happier I am than you are. Or if you really want to feel miserable, come and see how happy my life is. It's just awful. So, so the writer says, it's too distracting. A bit of jealousy crept in. And the thought, how can she look so happy when she doesn't know anything about real love? I haven't spoken to her for ages. Oh, this is easy. It's so easy for couples to look happy. You think they ever put their angry, scowling, sniping at their children, being sniped at by their children and their, and their wife? Do you think they ever put those videos on their Facebook page? Uh, no. Unless there's a little piece of sniping and lying and attacking that's brief and appears to be cute. Like when a 
three-year-old speaks up and tells off his parents and then they put it on YouTube and it gets, you know, 5 million hits and everybody goes, Was, wasn't that just darling? Uh, no, that's the kid at age three who when he's, I think he, the man was 62. That's, that's the kid at age three who's going to turn into the 62-year-old who's going to carry whatever it was, 24 automatic weapons up to the 32nd floor of the Mandalay Bay, and he's going to shoot 600 people. You think I'm kidding? I'm really not. That's where they come from. And the more we've learned about that guy who did the shooting, that's where he came from. He was miserable. He was unhappy. He was in a relationship with a girlfriend that was just awful. Um, no career. It just went on and on. He had every reason to hate himself, to hate life, and to hate Everybody that, in his perception, failed to connect with him. And because they so thoroughly failed, shooting people would mean pretty much nothing to him. These are all the people who've injured him all of his life, or at least they represented those people. So it's easy to go on Facebook, and everybody's comparing themselves to other people. It's kind of nuts. It's a forum Facebook is, for people to lie about themselves. It's institutionalized lying. Now, how could I say such a thing? Right as I'm saying this, there are people who are hearing me and going, oh, he's going off on one of his rants and being crazy again. There are. How do I know it's institutionalized lying? Because do you ever see random photos of people? on their Facebook page. Oh no, the ones who, only the pictures that have been carefully selected, edited, cropped, and probably airbrushed, or what's the word, photoshopped. Those are the pictures you see. Do you ever see the picture of somebody who's just gotten out of bed? They're sitting there on the edge of the bed, kind of going, oh man, I really don't want to get up. But I kind of have to, or I'm going to sit here and pee my pants. So <laughs> you don't ever see those pictures of them. You see the ones where they're all just perfect looking. It's a forum for lying. There's so much comparing and jealousy and lying. You continue. You conclude, actually. Out of the blue, my friend messaged me to say that our relationship, excuse me, that the relationship with the guy, sorry, was over. She said this, it's been hugely traumatic. To sum it up, now remember, this is the guy that she had described as being wealthy and perfect and kind and compassionate and, and lovely and that she put up 900 Facebook pictures of. She says, to sum it up, it turns out that he's a cross-dresser with tendencies toward young girls and a serious porn addiction and a whole lot more complicated stuff that I'm too embarrassed to even tell you about. Did you hear what I just said? All of that in a guy who has learned to smile perfectly for photographs that are going to go on Facebook or Snapchat, Snapchat or whatever all the other media are. Crazy. Really easy to look good. She says, her friend, it has messed my head up badly, and I have no intention of pairing up with anyone ever again. This week. <laughs> because pain triumphs everything. So your friend will get lonely, and that will hurt. And she'll want somebody's approval and she'll go out and date and she'll find somebody who looks absolutely perfect. And the closer she gets to them, the more that she'll learn that holy smokes, this person isn't at all like they look like on Facebook. And this isn't unusual. We've become masters at looking good. I mean, we're, we're amazingly skilled. We've been taught from an early age to fake it. One of my daughters uh, went to college and she went to a college that was mm, had a reputation for being more ethical, honest, open, 
than most. And she wrote back and she said, what a disappointment. She said, all anybody thinks about here is how they look. All anybody talks about here is how they look. The guys talk about how the girls look. The girls talk about how the girls look. Um, she said, it's really kind of depressing. We're great at faking it. And we buy it. We buy the faking of ourselves and other people. So nobody even knows that they're doing it. When we, since we've been trained to pretend from an early age, we don't even recognize that we're in a play that we didn't write. Our parents and other people wrote it. A stage that we didn't create. And we're speaking words that other people taught us to speak. Uh, occasionally, we'll actually interject a few words of our own, but it really doesn't materially change the play. We buy this. And if we're not as good at faking as other people, well, now we have to compare and we feel inferior. Solution, be you. Be you. Read all the real love literature. Go to the master index on the website and look up who we are. That's the index reference. Or integrity. Be yourself, which is only possible if you feel loved enough not to be afraid. That's the only way you will ever find out. No kidding. I talked to a lady last night uh, who, who was here for an intervention, I don't know, a couple months ago, probably. And she, and she just glows. No kidding. She said at work, people come up to her and say, what did you have done? As in, you know, did you have a facelift? Did you, you know, that kind of thing. What did you do? And all she did was learn how to be herself and not be afraid, not afraid of her son anymore, not afraid of the people at work anymore. She's happy all the time, which could only happen because she lost her fear. And she says, now I'm discovering who I really am. Every day is like an adventure. I discover skills, gifts, abilities, um, preferences that I didn't even know I had. Because all I did before was protect myself and try to look good. Yuck. But how fun for her, huh? That's called Freedom, being herself. New subject. Here's somebody who says, my daughter, Samantha, is sloppy with her schoolwork. For example, when she writes, the printing just tails off at the end of the line. You, you can picture this. You know, you start off writing bold, and by the end of the line, she's tired, and it just turns into little squiggles. The teacher grades her poorly because of it. And my daughter, Samantha, thinks that it's unfair of the teacher. What can I do? Right now, I just tell her to be neater. <laughs> I'll bet that works really well. So, Samantha, you just need to write neater. Mother. Oh, thank you. Thank you, my mother. It had never occurred to me <laughs> to do what my teacher's been telling me to do every single day. <laughs> I've been telling her to think about it. I've been telling her to look ahead at the end of the line so that the printing doesn't tail off. Yeah, you're just giving her a fix to the problem. And it's already been proven not to work because the teacher's already tried this. She needs more. She needs a reason to change her behavior, as almost everybody does. We won't completely change the way we do things just for no reason at all. We got to have a reason to do it. So ask her, when I tell you to empty the garbage, how would you like it if I hid the garbage bags or I locked the big garbage can that goes to the street? How would you like it if I did that? You have to empty the garbage and then I make it impossible for you to do that. She wouldn't. Why? because it's incredibly inconvenient. Because you've given her an instruction that now it's virtually impossible for her to do. Then you drop the metaphor on her head. You say, 
after she's agreed with you, it would be inconvenient and she would hate that. You say, well, oddly, honey, it's the same with your teacher. Now, twice now in this video chat, I've talked about trapping people um, with mm, logic, um, good sense. Somehow, I don't feel really bad um, trapping people with logic, common sense, the truth, and how to be more loving. Somehow that I'm, I'm going to be able to go to sleep tonight trapping people using those ends. It's the same with your teacher, you tell her. When you write poorly, it inconveniences her. She can't read what you're writing when you go scribble off at the end. And then she makes you pay for inconveniencing her. That's called being pretty human. No kidding. Natural, understandable. You would do the same thing. Same with talking to kids in the classroom. Uh, kids in classrooms talk to each other all the, all the time. And because I know you, I know your daughter does the same thing. It inconveniences the teacher because then she has to stop and address the misbehavior. And then she has to repeat herself. So what do you do? You learn to do what the teacher says. Why? Because it's a law? Uh, because you'll be shot? No, because it inconveniences her. She hears... I don't care about you and I don't love you. And then she pays you back. And you're not going to like how she pays you back. And then you're going to say it's unfair how she pays you back. And yet this is practice for, here we are again, the course on life. Because this is how it works in life. Try inconveniencing your boss consistently. Doing half of what he tells you to do. Yeah, that's not going to last a really long time. You're going to be fired. Then you're going to have no income. Then you're not going to be able to afford your rent. And then you're going to whine at everybody how it's just unfair. Now, hang on for what's going to follow then. Nobody's going to care because they're dealing with their own pain. And then you come along and you say, pay attention to my pain first. And they go, uh, hang on a second. Uh, no. So again, it's always about love. Really? So here's your daughter asking, what do I do about this teacher who's unfair to me? Your teacher doesn't feel unconditionally loved. And when you inconvenience her, you're telling her you don't care about her either. And then she's going to get you. So what's the solution? Care enough about your teacher to print big enough so she can read what you're writing. And she'll go away. She'll quit bothering you. She's not going to pick on you just randomly. New subject. My husband, Don, tends to avoid me and life by using the television to self-medicate. His assessment on how much time he spends watching television isn't anywhere near reality. If you were to ask him how much television do you watch in a day, he would say, well, you know, I, I watch a little news and the, the, maybe an hour. And it turns out it's five hours. So not even close. I talked with him and I said that in the past, I would just get angry at him and I would be wrong because I need to let you know what's going on for me and give him the opportunity to love me. I did it wrong, I realize now. I gave him too much information and not spe enough specific suggestions. So let's review this so that you know what she means by too much information. She said, I talked with him and said in the past, I would get angry at you. As soon as he hears, I would get angry at you, he's going to hear it as an attack. There's no way you can use those words without people not, hear, not hearing an attack. I would have gotten angry at you before. And they're going, well, they're going to pull out both their guns and prepare to shoot you. Now, I would be wrong to get angry at you. Yeah, see, you've already attacked him by saying I would have gotten angry at you. And now you're saying I would have been wrong. So... Now you're going to be self-righteous. Um, you talk to him too much about his mistake. If you want something to change, you have to make a specific request. So I got more specific, you say. I was having a hard time with this. Um, I could use a hug and some time connecting every day that's not around the television. And 
he could choose the amount of time. That's what I told him. Yeah, well, we've covered this before. You keep making demands that he spend some time with you, or sometimes you say more time with you, and he can choose the time. To 99.9% of people, that would sound reasonable. But see, he's already diligently avoiding this, spending time with you, because he wants to avoid you. And the demands of more and more just hang over his head like a sword. It's never going to work. You're requiring too much of him. You require him to do the thinking. You get to choose the time. Um, you're putting over his head this never-ending demand. I want more time and more and more and more. If you want time with your husband, listen slowly, honey. Ask for it. Ask for it each time. How hard is this? Would you go for a walk with me? Um, sometime in the next 20 minutes. And if he's still watching TV, you just come up with, with your obvious walking clothes on. Put a leash on your neck. If you, well, that'll make it pretty obvious that you're going for a walk. Um, and say, well, it's time to go. And turn off the television. This guy's never going to come up with this on his own. You want him to come up with things to do with you. And generally speaking, that is never going to happen. How do I know? Because you've been married for a hundred years and it hasn't happened so far and you keep hoping that it will. And you hope that if you say it nicer, would you just come up with things to do with me that then he'll do it? Uh, no, he really won't. So if you're not asking for his time specifically, here's what specific looks like. Don, I wish you'd spend more time with me. No. That's not how, that, that's not a specific request. That's death. Don, sometime in the next 20 minutes, I would like you to go for a walk with me. We're going to go to the park. Um, we'll swing for a little bit, back, swing on the swings, and we'll be back within 35 minutes. That is a specific request. And he can handle that specific request. And if he's still watching television when 20 minutes elapses, don't do what you've always done, which is sulk in the bedroom and go, well, see, I told him 20 minutes and he didn't come and get me. <laughs> you can be so nasty and negative when you don't get what you want. Why would he want to come and get you? He, he would prefer that you move to Ecuador. No, so you just come in, turn the television off, hand him his coat with no irritation. If you're irritated, you're done. And you say, let's go. I'm looking forward to this. Well, you've got your coat on. You're handing him his coat. You turned off the television. He knew this was coming. Uh, this isn't mysterious to him. I know him. He's not a bad person. He does need a little direction, however. But you don't complain about how much television he watches. That's just stupid. If there's something you want, ask for that. But don't complain about what he doesn't do. You have nothing to complain about. Let me know how this goes. Because if you do it, baby, it will work. We'll see you all in a week.